Hi, my name is Alison Ward. I am an intuitive and a mental wellness mentor living in the UK. I had my near-death experience on July 5th, 1994. So let me tell you a little bit about that. I'd left an abusive relationship and was living on my own with my two-year-old son. And we were happy. We were living life. He was at nursery and I was at work. And I'd, I'd formed a new relationship with a really lovely man. I had no intention of meeting anybody. And he didn't have any intention of meeting anybody, but it happened. And, and we, we connected straight away. Interestingly, he told me that um, he was due to go on a biking trip all around Europe for six weeks with a friend of his. Being booked for a while, he'd been separated from his wife for a year, and it's something that he wanted to do as part of his healing journey. I was absolutely fine with that because I thought that would be good. It would give us some time apart to really decide if we wanted to be with each other, even though we knew that we did. So it worked out really well. We had a lovely six weeks before he went away. In between time, the father of my two-year-old son was being his normal self. He was being unreliable in that he didn't turn up when he said he'd turn up to see his son. Uh, he didn't contribute financially and he, he would be quite abusive. One of the reasons I left him was because he drank and he also did drugs. I found out later um, to an extent that I wasn't aware of. So it was just not something that I could stay living in. So we left him and I found a little house that we lived in happily and created our new life. So on the day that my now husband went away to Europe, it was the 5th of July, 1994. And uh, he was safely away and I wish him all the very best and hope that he had a lovely time. On that day at 5.15 in the evening, I was cooking a spaghetti bolognese for me and my son and there was a knock at the door. And as I opened the door, my son's dad was standing there, his natural father. Now, this surprised me because he told me he was working in another part of the UK for a restoration job. And it didn't make sense him being there because it, it was about a five hour journey from where we lived. He looked reasonably clean and tidy. I couldn't smell alcohol. His demeanour looked okay, as much as okay is. And he just said very simply, I've come here to talk about Sam. And I thought, hallelujah. He's coming to really step up and be the father that he's meant to be. So I invited him in. And as I invited him in, I just turned the stove off in the kitchen, because obviously I was cooking, and we went into our very small living lounge area where Sam, my two-year-old son, was playing. As he was playing, his dad totally ignored him. Now, he hadn't seen him for two weeks, so obviously this was odd, and it did alert me. I then got a whiff of al alcohol, and I realised that potentially we, I, could be in danger, because when he'd had alcohol, he could be very aggressive and violent. As I stood there just trying to take it all in, he just very calmly said to me, today's the day you're going to die. I've planned it all. And with that, he produced a knife from his back pocket, headbutted me twice, pushed me into a corner and started stabbing at my chest. My little boy was absolutely horrified. Incredibly, as I was told afterwards, due to adrenaline rush, he was able to jump on his father's back, punch and kick and try and stop him. In fact, he did whatever he could to abort this attack. He brought my glasses up that I used to watch TV. He brought the little dressing gown belt that used to sit and rub in his eye when he was trying to get to sleep. He even did a poo in the potty to try and distract him from what he was doing. It was an horrendous attack, extremely petrifying. I realised it was like watching a horror movie and that actually I was in the horror movie. We were in the horror movie. I'd never known fear and pain like it. And then suddenly 
I left my body. I actually felt my energy leave my body through the top of my head. I liken it to the sound of a cork being popped from a bottle and I felt this huge release. I can't explain it any other way than that. As I left my body, I left the room. I wasn't scared. I wasn't in pain. I wasn't even worried about my son. And I moved at speed. I couldn't work out whether I was moving forwards or whether the triangle of light I saw was moving towards me. But what I can remember is that as I was moving, I would see snapshots of people, little black and white photos of people that I knew either side of me. And it was making this noise like, ch -ch 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 -ch, as if we were on the train. And I recall looking at some of the pictures and thinking, oh, I've not seen him for a while. I wonder how he is. Oh, I must catch up with so-and-so. It was very bizarre. At the same time as I was moving towards this light, I had felt a great sense of peace. There was no fear in me whatsoever. And then I started to feel the love just envelop me. It was the purest, sweetest, most gracious love I've ever experienced. And I'm a mom of two very dear boys and in a very happy marriage. This love was on a different scale. It was all encompassing. It was accepting. It was soothing. It was loving. I had no fears and no pain whatsoever. As I continued to move towards this light, I noticed there was a triangle of people my welcoming committee, I called them. And at the very point of the triangle was my beautiful granddad, Sam, who my son was named after. My mum's dad. He died when he was 76. Oh my gosh, he looks so, so well. And as I was moving towards him, I was so close to hugging him and receiving a hug back. Until I heard a very old-fashioned Birmingham, brummy English voice say to me, it's not time to go yet, duck. And then I was back in my body, just literally back in my body. And in front of me, I was a bloody mess. I had stab rings to my chest. There was blood all over the carpet and the walls. I had pulled my leg up to protect my chest and that had a gaping wound in it. And it just missed the main artery. And Sam, as you can imagine, was over in the corner away from the scene, but extremely frightened and traumatised by what he had witnessed. As I was still straddled at the time, because I was in the corner of the room, and Graham, Sam's dad, was straddling me, I very calmly said to him, what would your mum do if she saw you doing this to me and Sam? His mum had passed a few years earlier. I said it so calmly, so calmly. He met, let out this amazing animal noise. Oh, yelp. I've not heard it since. And as he let out that noise, he slightly moved backwards. I don't know how this happened, but I was able to get up and jump over him, running out of my little house, leaving my little boy behind. He tried to come after me by pulling my very short hair and we found clumps of it later all along the walls. But I was in fight or flight. I ran to the little shop on the corner of my road, asked them to call an ambulance and the police. The next thing that I knew, Graham had taken Sam in a car and was found by the police. Covered in fumes, he was trying to gas himself and Sam. He had Sam on his lap. The police had to force the window open and arrest Graham and take Sam to hospital where he was dealt with carbon monoxide fumes. So as you can imagine, we both had PTSD. It was an horrific time when it happened, but also after it happened, the aftermath was huge. Lost my home, lost my job, lost friends because I didn't know who I could trust. And I had to move back to live with mum and dad because I wasn't in a fit state to look after Sam. What was really interesting and a huge comfort to me was when my mum and dad came to see me at the hospital, I told my mum very excitedly, in amongst all this pain and trauma, 
because I was now feeling pain and trauma, emotional and physical pain, and I felt very unsafe. I remember saying to my mum, I saw Grandad, Mum, I saw Grandad, he looked so well. And I said, I died and I came back. And even now, talking about that, that time when I did die and came back, it fills me with so much emotion because it was such a beautiful, beautiful experience and a safe experience. Yet at this time that I was conveying what happened, I didn't feel safe. I wasn't convinced that Graham had been arrested and that Sam and I were safe. It took 13 months for him to go to prison and he, he was sentenced to only three years. Served 18 months of which most of it was in an open prison where he got fit. In the meantime, we were trying to get well. There wasn't much help at the time. But interestingly, I noticed that when I came back from this near-death experience, I came back very different. I had a deep sense of knowing, wisdom that I'd never had before and became very, very intuitive. I would know when things would happen. I would pick up on people's feelings. We use the term empath, don't we, for that? And over the years, that has really become my superpower. So what I decided to do, or what we decided to do as a family, was to turn all the upsets and the hate and the bitterness and the pain into something positive. So we turned the beautiful gift in the ugly box, as I called it, into an inspirational turnaround of events. A dear friend said to me, the best form of happiness is the best form of revenge is happiness. And I decided there and then I was going to get myself well, help my son become well again. And that led me on to developing my intuitive gift that I've been given and developing my sense of knowing and connection. And my spiritual connection as a result has become very, very strong. What's also happened and has helped many people that I've worked with over the years because I've got my own business, I'm a self-employed mental, wellness mentor and intuitive. So I use my gift to help people when they're going through their life challenge. But I decided that to overcome and survive such a monumental event in my history and my son's history, that if I could be that person that could have helped me when I needed it, then that was my purpose. Over the years, I've had many dreams of leave my body and going back. And very often I can still do that, leave my body, and then I'll come back. I suppose it's a form of meditation. I do it regularly to help me become revitalized or healed or to receive guidance. And I've passed that on to my family and friends. The beautiful thing that has come out of this, apart from my absolute belief and knowing that there is life after death, is that I've been able to share that with other people who are fearful of dying. The process of dying is the most beautiful, beautiful situation and experience that you can ever have. I can't remember what being birthed is like, but I'm damn sure dying is, is a better experience. There are people who love you, people who you've never met, and they will welcome you. It is safe and it is loving and you're going to be okay. Friends, work colleagues, people that I've maybe met once or twice, it was, there were just loads of them. I mean, if you imagine how many people you must meet in a lifetime, but there were literally, literally little black and white photos and I, I was just being shown them constantly. They're just coming like this and it sounded like the noise of a train. And some of them I didn't recognize, but I knew I knew them at some point, but I did, could have been a former work colleague. Um, but yeah, I, I know I've not heard that before from other people, but that was definitely my experience. I keep thinking of that saying, you know, your life flashes before your eyes. Um, maybe there were people that I've known flashed before my eyes, but I often wonder, was it the brain trying to make... I don't really understand 
all I know is is that that was my experience, just as the cork coming out of the bottle was, you know, my experience at the time. This is interesting. Bit I knew I knew them, but I didn't know them. And when I explained how some of them looked, my mum was saying to me, "Oh, that's your great great grandmother. That's so. That's Auntie So and So." And people that were my relatives and had died before I'd met them. All I, the only voice I heard was that very old fashioned Birmingham accent that said, you're not, you're not, it's not time to die. It's not time to go yet, Chuck. It's not time to go yet. Chuck, not Chuck. That's the only voice I heard. Even my granddad didn't speak to me, which the interesting thing was we didn't need words. I felt that connection from all of them. And I was just enthralled at seeing how well my granddad looked because he looked so much younger. He looked well, he looked fit, um, and I was just getting closer and closer to him, and I just was looking forward to having that bug. He died at 76, and I would say he was probably in his mid-50s. No one looked really old, older than me. I was 29 at the time, but no one looked really old. I would say they were all, actually, I've never thought about that. That's true. They were probably all about that same age. I definitely wanted to stay. The bizarre thing was, and this is something that I really struggled with for quite a while, I wasn't concerned about Sam, and yet I'm such a doting mother and was a doting mother. And that wasn't that I didn't care or that I wasn't worried about him. All that concern had just disappeared. It, I was just in this most beautiful, loving experience that I just didn't want to come away from. What I couldn't work out, I couldn't work out if I was moving towards the light, if the light was moving towards me. But I must have been moving forward because my hair was being swept that way. And there was no temperature. I, you know, the temperature was comfortable. So it wasn't cold. It wasn't hot. Um, but as I got closer to this triangle of people, the light was, it, it was like the brightest sunshine you could ever see. You could look at it and it wouldn't hurt your eyes. So this, this light was just coming towards me and it was just getting wider and enveloping me as I was getting closer to that triangle of people. So I didn't feel any pain at all during the near-death experience. But before I went, I was feeling incredible heat, pain. Um, that's how I describe the feeling of being stabbed and feeling the taste of blood. And then when I came back and I was into the room and could see what a bloody mess it was, um, I was feeling pain. But alongside that pain, I had that, I had such calmness about me. I'm not scared of dying at all. I don't want to die in pain. That That's the one thing <laughs> that, that does sometimes, you know, if I thought about it, I don't want to die in pain. But the actual act of dying, not at all, not at all. My first job after um, feeling well enough to go back to work again, so couldn't work for a couple of years, was teaching, recruiting and training volunteers in a hospice. And I was there for four and a half years. And what was interesting, a lot of the patients who were dying, they would come up to me and want to speak to me. And the policy there was if a patient wants to speak to you, you stop what you're doing and you sit and you speak to them. <laughs> I spent most of my time speaking to these amazing patients who just tell me stuff and ask me stuff. A lot of them didn't know what had happened to me. They, they would often ask me what, I thought dying was like, and you would know how when people are terminally ill and facing their death, they will talk very openly about that. And we had some amazing discussions. Since people have seen uh, my interviews, and I, I've also wrote a book about uh, my experience, I've had a lot of people contact me who've got this real fear of death. I remember one guy in particular, it was almost... Well, it was. It was a phobia of his. It stopped him from doing things. And I just spoke to him for about 20 minutes. And he said that I gave him, that I gave him and the situation gave him comfort, which was a wonderful thing for me to be able to do for someone who had such, um, you know, a distorted and painful view of something that's so beautiful. I was always um, one of those weird children that would see things and hear things and say things that would happen, but it definitely fine-tuned afterwards. And 
can say it's my superpower really if, if I'm working um, with a client who's going through a life challenge I'll intuitively know when to pause I'll intuitively know when to ask a question or what to ask sometimes it's incredibly random and when I say the question you can see their mouth fall open so it really helps with the work that I do um, it isn't it's like I have a sense of knowing but also I sometimes smell stress on people that I didn't smell before. There's a certain smell, it's a very earthy smell. I will often, if someone's in pain, this, this happened at the hospice actually, on a Wednesday we would have the ladies who were going through the breast cancer experience on a Wednesday afternoon, they'd come to the day hospice. And there was this one woman there who are particularly uh, connected with, she was the same age as me, she had two children the same age as mine, and she always asked me to come and sit with her. And this one time she was having, she just had chemotherapy. Was it the morning or the day before? I can't remember. And she was feeling very nauseous. So as I was talking to her, I started to feel nauseous and had to excuse myself where I was really violently sick. Eventually came back and sat with her and <laughs> said, I've just been sick. So well, I feel great now. And that's what I noticed. I would often pick up on how people were feeling. So if someone's feeling physically ill, I'd start to feel ill. If someone was feeling tired, I'd start to feel very drained. If someone was stressed, I'd start to feel their stress and know where it was in the body. And of course, a lot of people think that was like woo-woo, but I'm very practical down to earth. People start to listen to me because I'd say things that I didn't know. Someone was having stress at home because of, you know, ABC, I, I wouldn't know that. So there's been lots of validation over the years, but obviously some people still think it's a bit woo-woo, but I just decided rather, because I used to be a bit embarrassed about it, and but then I realised that actually, no, it is my superpower and use it. It often comes through my senses. So, for example, the other day, a friend of mine lost a watch that was very dear to her. She had it for her 21st and she's 60 now, so you can imagine. And I, as soon as she said about this watch, I just had an image of her wearing a denim jacket. And as she pulled the denim jacket, the watch came loose. And she found the watch in the hall underneath where she hung a denim jacket that she had been wearing. And I just saw a picture of it. I can't explain that. I just said, all I can see is a denim jacket and your watch is caught up in the sleeve. And it's it's whether it wasn't put on properly or it worked itself loose, but it was on the floor in the hall beneath where she just popped the den jacket over the bottom of the stairs. If I'm speaking to them, um, they'll be telling me what their challenge are going through, and, and I'll say, "Some this is typical. I'm feeling a real sicky feeling in my stomach." That's and they'll say, "That's exactly how I'm feeling," or "I'm feeling the pain in my lower back." So. Over the years, I've had to almost put a filter up so I don't feel stuff so much because it can really make me tired and wear me out and I want to be effective of what I do. Sometimes I'll have dreams about people or situations and then I will say, oh, I dreamt about you the other day. And they'll say, oh, my God. You know, that's that's what I was doing. Um, my dad passed last year and I've dreamt about him so many times. And... That's been really comforting because dad had dementia, had, had dementia, vascular dementia, and he was in a home for four and a half, no, four years. So he'd had it for quite a long time, this dementia. So you go through two lots of grief. Um, but what's been wonderful is I feel closer to my dad than I've ever felt because I dream about him so much and hear him say, you know, I'm helping you out and calling, calling me my nickname and, you know, it's, that is extremely comforting. Uh, I lost my uh, best friend uh, two weeks after her 40th birthday. She died of cancer. And um, I, she would, because she said to me, I'll make sure I get in touch with you when I go. This is quite a funny story. She was a single mom. She had three children. So before she died, I did a fundraiser for her to raise some money so she could just leave some money for the kids and sort a few things out. We raised, we raised £6,000 pounds which was quite a lot of money back then. And I said to her, well, what sign are you going to give me? And she laughed and she said, pickled onions. <laughs> pickled onions, okay. 
anyway, she died on Saturday lunchtime, and then uh, obviously just before she died, I sensed that she was going soon, and I suddenly became very tired, and my husband said, just go and lie down on your bed. So I went and lay down for a bit, and then a few minutes later, I had the call to say she'd passed, so I wasn't surprised. And then you know what it's like when you hear of a death. Um, you tend to act a little bit erratically. So I decided then and there to go food shopping. Silly thing to do, but I did. And I wasn't taking anyone with me. I was going on my own and doing it on my own. And I was putting cat litter in the trolley. We haven't got a cat. I was putting a load of rubbish in the trolley. And then I come to a section where I bumped my trolley into this display and I sort of stopped myself in my tracks just at the same time where I heard her voice clear as anything, get a grip. And I was in front of a load of pickled onions. So I start laughing and then I'm crying. I have to leave my trolley and go home. And then about a year after that, as a family, we were driving from the UK to Spain. And we got to France and we had all the windows closed because we had the air con on. Gail loved France and we could all smell pickled onions and I said oh my god Gail's with us so that that was that was a funny story I lost my friend as well last year and that was a real shock there were three deaths last year that was a real shock on the morning when she died and I got the call literally I heard her say I don't know where I am Ali she's always she's called me Ali not many people call me Ali I'm lost I don't know where I am and I just had to say, look, you, you've passed, Jane, you've passed. But go home now. And um, I know that she got home. So, for example, uh, the one time not long after Dad passed, um, I was asked, you know, I was asking a question and then just writing. I wasn't even thinking about what I was writing. It was like, got, some people call it channeled writing, don't they? Or it's a dreams. And sometimes I'll have a thought. That was it. We, we've got a situation at the moment where... Um, my, my business has really been affected since lockdown because people obviously have to pay to work with me. So I've decided to pivot it and get a part-time job twice a week and focus on getting that. So I've got some regular money coming in that I know is coming in and then start building the business up again. And I kept hearing my dad say something he would always say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So what I've done, I've been contacting people who I know and trust and saying, look, this is so I didn't want to advertise, that's what I was doing, because I didn't want to lose any more business. But a couple of people who I've worked with have given me some vacancies I've since applied for this week, so that would be interesting. And I keep hearing it, it's not what you know, it's who you know, and it's something he would always say. So that's what I'm basing my <laughs> recruitment search on, if you like. The day he died, or the day after he died, my older son he was living with us because he'd been made redundant. He'd, he'd been through a terrible time. He'd just been offered a fantastic job the day that my dad died. So he said to myself and my husband, I want to take us out for a meal. So we went to this place, this an, like an American barbecue place. It's called Hickory's. And we used to call my dad the barbecue king. So it was, as we were there, we were saying, you know, I wonder if he'll send us a sign. And then just above me, it said Barbecue King. So I was literally sitting underneath a sign that said Barbecue King. Just as we were saying, Can, you know, I wonder if we'll get a sign. And Sam said, Mom, look, look what's above your head. I know here in the UK, you must have them in America. There are doulas, aren't there, and people who are teaching people about death, almost like death counsellors. If, if someone's in a position where have been given a terminal illness diagnosis or they I know we're all dying but they know that death is closer than they'd like definitely reach out to people like myself who've been through uh, this experience but also get the right sort of help so that you can put your life to bed and do what will help you and your loved ones when you pass a memory box and to say sorry and thank you to people in life so that You've completed your project for this lifetime. Mm -hmm.